Today, we're looking at a lesson titled, God Knows His Own. So let's turn to the book of Psalm 139. Psalms 139, and we're going to read verses 1 to 5. Psalms 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsetting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought after all, afar off. <clears throat> thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, for lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. So David here is talking about the omniscience, um, the presence of God in his life. <clears throat> He's speaking about the awe-inspiring comprehension that God has of him, and the things, the intimate things that are taking place. <clears throat> he knows David's thoughts. He knows the things that David is going to say before he says them. Before he says them, he knows his intents, the thoughts of his heart, <clears throat> which illustrates a principle that we want to touch upon this morning. And that scripture teaches God has an eternal relationship with those who are His. He sees and shares their beginning, their time on earth in a place in eternity. This is a, a comprehension that we can gain when we get the knowledge of God, the Spirit of God in our life. We understand how God relates to us and how we relate to Him. We didn't just come into a relationship with Him in this life. God looks at us from an eternal perspective. He has an eternal relationship with us. He was with us in our beginning, He's with us in our time on earth, and He's with us in eternity. We're talking about the relationship that God has with us. It's not start with this life. It started in eternity. God was with us in eternity, He's with us in this life, and He'll be with us in eternity. And this psalm gives us an understanding and illustration of how God sees us. He sees us as we were. He sees us as we are. He sees us as we will be. And that's how he deals with us. <clears throat> we want to take a look at the scriptures giving us the understanding of how God relates to his people. Turn to Jeremiah, the first chapter, verse 4 to 5. Jeremiah, first chapter, verse 4 to 5. First chapter, verse four to five. Scripture says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. The word knew there in the Hebrew is have an intimate relationship. It's the same word that's used for intimate sexual contact between a husband and wife. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. We had a relationship. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So he's telling Jeremiah, he wants Jeremiah to see 
his life from God's perspective. Jeremiah is a very young man. He's probably a teenager. And God's calling him to be the prophet to a backslidden people. But he wants him to know that God's with him and God is going to enable him to carry out the ministry that he has the purpose for Jeremiah. He's saying here, Jeremiah, I see you, I encompass you totally. We've always had a relationship. We always will have a relationship. <clears throat> Turn to the book of Zechariah, Old Testament. Zechariah, the 12th chapter. That's why it's so important for us to pursue the scripture because you come across the understanding of God through God's word. This world is going to dump on you big time its priorities, its stupidity. For God will give you understanding of truth. God will give you an understanding of the way the things actually operate in his relationship and how he sees things. Zechariah, 12th chapter. And when you get there, we want verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. Saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundations of the earth. So that wants to know, us to know his infinite sea, his power, his might, his majesty. God spreads forth the heavens with his hand, and his, his fingers span the length of the heavens, he tells us in his word. He laid the foundation of this physical universe and formeth the spirit of man within him. So God does things <clears throat> in a vast way and he does things in an intimate way with his people, those that he has a relationship with. Man is a triune being. We're composed of three components, body, soul, and spirit, all put together by God. <coughs> Each part of man functions in a unique way. And God illustrates in his word how we function. The problem that we have is we live in ignorance of how God formed us and how God has mandated us to operate. <clears throat> so Zechariah lets us know that God has intimately put us together and formed and fashioned us for life on earth. Now turn to the book of Acts, Acts the 13th chapter. <coughs> Background. The Lord has ascended back to the presence of the Father and has given the the apostles a great commission to go forth and proclaim the word of God. But what has happened here, <clears throat> since we know that the first Christians were Jews, all the apostles were Jews. And so they, because of their mindset, have been reluctant to take the gospel to the Gentiles. The only way the Gentiles have heard the gospel is if they become proselytes. In other words, if they've adopted the Jewish religion, now they can sit under the feet of the apostles and hear the gospel. But as far as the Gentiles that are in the world are concerned, the Jews are very reluctant to take the word to them. And this has been a situation for about 10 years until Paul comes on the scene. And Paul has been commissioned to take the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles. And he takes the gospel to the Jews, and the Jews begin to hear it, but when they find out that Paul is wanting to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, they become offended. This is where we pick up this particular scripture. Acts 13, 
Starting at verse 45, and we're going to read to verse 48. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. What does that mean? The word ordained there <clears throat> basically means appointed. So these Gentiles that heard the word and received it gladly, had from eternity been appointed for salvation by God. They were God's people from eternity. God has chosen those that are His, not in this life, but in eternity. What is the, what is the method that God uses? God uses the method of those that will receive Him. If you will receive God, if you walk with Him and talk with Him, you are chosen of Him. These Gentiles out of all the masses of Jews and Gentiles that heard had from eternity been ordained to salvation. This day that Paul is preaching was noted by God as the time in which these Gentiles would hear and be saved. We see that God deals with his people from eternity, not this life. And God expects us to look at our lives from an eternal perspective. As you see your life from an eternal perspective, God becomes more real. God becomes greater. God becomes more solid in your life. And you cling to him. Because you see him from a greater perspective than people who don't know him and imagine what, him, what he is and the things that he does. God will reveal himself to you from an eternal perspective. Now, turn to the book of the prophet Haggai in the Old Testament. Here we see God speaking to specific people about what will take place in eternity concerning them. What they will be doing in eternity because of their faithfulness in this life. The prophet Haggai, second chapter. The best way to get to these prophets is go to the last book of the, of the New Testament, Matthew, and go back. <clears throat> As you go back, you meet the books that we were just looking at, Zechariah, and uh, <clears throat> you come to that guy. When you get to Haggai, we want the second chapter. I want you to the second chapter, we want verse 23. God speaking to his servant, the man who was governor of Judah at this time, they were well, they were in captivity, they had been released and went back to Israel. This man has been faithful to build the walls of Jerusalem, to restore the worship of the Lord to Jerusalem. So the Lord speaks to this man, Zerubbabel, about what he's going to be doing in eternity. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shaltiel, saith the Lord, and I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. So the Lord speaks to this man who has been faithful to him because of the opposition. It hasn't been easy of restoring the temple worship, of restoring the things that God desires for his people to experience. And because of the faithfulness of this man, he's telling him, in eternity, you're going to be a precious 
servant to me. You'll be like a jewel. God will reveal to you, if you're open to receive it, things in this life and things in eternity that he's got reserved for you. Turn to Matthew, 8th chapter. Matthew, 8th chapter, verse 11 and 12. Jesus speaking to the multitudes, wanting them to see themselves from the perspective of eternity, wanting them to understand they have a chance now to accept him and to have a place in the kingdom in eternity. Matthew 8, verses 11 to 12, we read, Jesus speaking to the multitudes, and I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the Gentiles that will be saved in this life, will share eternity with the Jews in the kingdom of God. And then he goes on, verse 13, verse, verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's talking to those that are rejecting him. He's saying you're sealing your faith. If you do not receive me in this life, you will be exiled from my presence in eternity. Those like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who have received me will sit down with the Gentiles who have received me in the kingdom of God and share the beauties and the glories of the things that I've reserved for them in eternity. But you yourself, who are destined, wanted to have the blessings of this life in eternity, you will be separated from all of this in a region called outer darkness. So Jesus sees us from a standpoint of eternity. We see ourselves from a standpoint of time. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, I got this bill to pay, or um, uh, my dog is sick, or uh, that person don't like me, or whatever it is. A little picky -un thoughts that really, from an eternal perspective, are insignificant, we are focused on. God sees you a million years from now, and that's how he's dealing with you in this life, he's preparing you. For life and eternity with him if you will accept it if you don't accept it like these jews that won't accept it you'll be exiled out you'll be separated from it these scriptures are given so that we understand how god is dealing with us turn to ezekiel 34th chapter verse 21 22 to 24 ezekiel 34 Ezekiel is a book in which you will find quite a lot of this type of um, principle illustrated. Ezekiel 34, 22 to 24. Here we see the destiny of David, King David, what he's going to be doing in eternity. Therefore, will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David, he shall feed them, he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their guide, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. David's destiny is spoken of many times in the scripture in eternity. Turn to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, verse 
23 to 25. They are talking about the Lord and his second coming, gathering Israel to himself, making them the number one nation of the earth. Ezekiel 37, 23 to 25. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Again, the promises of God are eternal. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood that. That's why the scripture tells us they were able to deal with whatever problem life threw at them because they weren't concerned about the things of this life. Matter of fact, turn over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12 chapter. Excuse me, Hebrews the eleventh chapter. We want verses eight to nine, uh, eight to ten. Hebrews eleven, verses eight to ten. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. God told him to go to a land that he'd never even heard of, didn't speak the language. He was 75 years old when the Lord called him. But it says that God had given him specific promises along with this instruction of where to go. And Abraham picked up, took his wife, his possessions, and out he went. Totally dependent upon God. Why? Because of the promises that had been given him. <clears throat> Verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was given an eternal perspective of his life. Abraham grabbed that eternal perspective and ran with it the rest of his life. That eternal perspective dealt with things that would take place in this life, things that would take place in eternity. The Lord said, if you're faithful to me, Abraham, if you believe these promises, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you heirs in the millions. I'm going to make them kings over the, over the nations in eternity. And you, Abraham, are going to be a member of an eternal city. They call that city Zion. We call it New Jerusalem. And Abraham was told about the glories of this city, the street of gold, the things that would put, pertain to him because he walked and he talked with the Lord. <clears throat> and he took that promise and he ran with it. He was able to go anywhere that the Lord would direct him, do anything that the Lord would direct him to do. And because he was faithful, the Lord made him a rich man. It made him the patriarch of a nation that one day will be the number one nation of the earth. Abraham had a vision. A vision was that city that one day he would enter into. The same thing is true with us. God will give you promises in his word. 
You take those promises, God will give you understanding of the promises, your place, not only in this life, but in eternity. The Holy Spirit is not <clears throat> basically <clears throat> a, uh, <clears throat> he's not uh, moved by individuals. He loves everybody the same. God loves you just as much as he loved Jesus. His love is spread across the board for his people. The problem we have is through ignorance, we don't understand how God sees us, the plan of God for our life, our place in the scheme of things. The Bible answers all your questions if you don't turn to it. The Lord has revealed in his word things for you as an individual as well as a group. He's given the Holy Spirit so that we can comprehend his majestic plan for the ages, his purposes, for his people, the direction that he's going to take us. So all listed in the scripture here. <clears throat> Let's continue. Jesus and his disciples, the same thing. He told them what they'd be doing in eternity. Turn to Matthew, 19th chapter. Verse 27 to 28. Matthew 27-28 The disciples were curious as to what God had for them. They had forsaken everything and followed him. And I believe it delights the Lord when we come before him and question what it's all about. Well, what, what do I have? What do I inherit? What's going to happen to me in eternity? I believe God is pleased to explain these things to his people. Verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto them, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, in other words, at the time of the second coming, at the time of the restoration of all things, <coughs> In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They're going to be judges, judging from heaven. What is a judge? A judge is an individual. Moses was a judge. He decides. He makes decisions for people who need guidance who don't have an understanding of a particular thing, a particular purpose. There will be two groups in eternity. The body of Christ is going to be developed into two groups, kings and priests. <coughs> you read about that in the book of Revelation. You read about that in the plan of God. The kings will rule. The priests will be the instructors, the scholars, the teachers, bringing the word, the understanding of the ways and the will of God to the entire creation. God has glorious plan for his people as we line up in this life preparing ourselves for what God has called us to in eternity. He gives us a job to do in this life to prove our faithfulness to him, to be open to receive understanding of his plan and his eternal purpose for us. So that the apostles are going to be judges. They're going to be priests in eternity. <clears throat> we see a continuation of <clears throat> of this throughout the scripture. <clears throat> Turn to the book of Luke, 22nd chapter, <clears throat> verse 28 to 30. He also promised them other things. <clears throat> Luke 22, 
28 to 30. Here are they which have continued with me in my tribulation. So the prerequisite for this is living a committed life. Being willing to experience the sufferings of Christ. If you live committed, you're going to experience opposition. You're going to experience rejection. You're going to experience all sorts of negative things. But that goes with the territory. Jesus says, if you are willing to live that type of a life, then this will pertain to you. You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink in my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. When it talks about being kings and priests, it means exactly that. You're going to be ruling over your own kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven. You're going to be lifted to a state of exaltation in the kingdom of God. The scripture talks about those that will rule over ten cities, those that rule over five cities, those that will rule over nations, those that will judge the nations. God has a plan prepared from eternity. From eternity. What you are doing is qualifying for what God called you to do in eternity. He either called you as a king or a priest. And in this life, if you're faithful to him, it means you're qualified to step into that position when you leave this life. If you don't, then you won't. Turn to Revelation Third chapter, we close them with this. Third chapter. Mm -hmm. Revelation third chapter, verse ten and eleven. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is a promise of deliverance in the rapture. <clears throat> There's going to come a time when this whole world is going to be caught up and all the Christians that are left behind are going to be persecuted and hunted down for their faith. But those who are counted worthy to escape are going to be in heaven looking at all the things that will be taking place on the earth. Then he goes on. Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. In other words, what you've been promised from eternity, hold on to it in this life. Don't let it, don't let yourself be robbed of it. He goes on. Behold, I come quickly, hold it fast, which thou hast, and no man take thy crown. The crown is going to be the sign of your qualifying for the position that God's called you to. It's the last thing Paul wrote about before he went to his martyrdom. He's now laid up for me a crown, which the Lord thy God, my God, will give me at that day. And not only to me, but unto all those that love his appearing. So as you're faithful to the Lord, if you're fine doing business for the Lord when he comes, then all this, all that has been promised will be yours. And you will enter into the states of glory that God has prepared for you. If you're not, then you won't. You'll see somebody else take what God has initially desired for you to have. You see somebody else sit on your throne, somebody else wear your crown, somebody else oversee your kingdom in the kingdom of God. You don't want that to happen. Question. Yes. <clears throat> what if you're not really into or interested in being a ruler or a king or a priest? 
what if you just want to exist, live, enjoy fellowship with your friends, be the dog catcher, you know, nothing. Well, if you just don't want all of the power and all this stuff, you just want to, I thought when you go to heaven, now you're with all your friends, and your family, and you worship God, and then, you know, uh, you have your place that you live, you go to your place, and then you gather at certain places at certain times, and um, I, I've never heard about, uh, or I've never understood why everyone has to be a ruler. And everyone has to be a judge. And everyone, where's the rest of the people? Where are the Indians? Because there's too many chiefs. Uh, God is the head chief. But where, where, are the, where are the little Indians that just are there in heaven and having a good time and feeling great because they're, they're in the presence of God? But, you know, uh, the way you're explaining it, our destination and what we are striving for to be a king or a priest. And I don't want to be a king or a priest. I just want to be there in heaven. I just want to enjoy being around Christ. And just, you got a whole eternity. I think you're looking at it from a human perspective. Being a king or a priest means that you can experience eternal life from the highest state of existence. You get the greatest joy, the greatest satisfaction. But if you don't want that, then God's not going to force you to do that. There are levels of ex existence, levels of life experience and eternity. The kings and the priests are very small in number. And believe me, they're far more brave than there are chiefs. Uh, when you talk about the creation, you're talking about abodes of trillions and trillions of intelligences that go beyond what the mind can conceive of. And the person that's not interested in educating them, not interested in the joy that comes forth from giving the things of God to God's creation, God's not going to force that to happen. What would be is that individual be on a lower plateau, enjoying life, but realizing when you get to eternity, what you could have been, and the joys and the fulfillment that you will have missed out because you didn't want the opposition, you didn't want the opportunity. Rulership in heaven is nowhere near like rulership on earth. What is taking place on earth is a defilement and corruption of the glorious ability that God enables his creation to enjoy through his sovereignty. Uh, we have an opportunity here. It's a one-time opportunity. And what we do with it, God will acknowledge. God will acquiesce to. If, like Paul, we zealously pursue it, like Christ, the, the main thing that Christ talked about is only one message that he ever preached, and that was the kingdom. Everything he preached was an aspect of the kingdom. God will acquiesce to our decision. That will have a place for that person in eternity where they will enjoy life. They will experience the glories and fellowship and all, the, and all that goes with it. But they'll be on a lesser plane of enjoyment than they could have had had they stepped into what he had prepared for them. That's the whole aspect of that master plan. Somebody else will take that person's position. Somebody else will enjoy what God had originally planned for the individual. Each one of us makes a decision. Sharon, would you ask the Lord's blessing? Yes. Um, Father God, I, it is an honor to be loved by you. It is an honor to love you, Lord. Um, you are the good shepherd. And when we spend time with you, we hear your voice clear. Yes. Father, we want everything that you have for us. We want to be useful on this earth, Lord. Um, remove everything and anything that doesn't allow that, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters here that are pursuing you with their hearts, Lord. So, Father God, I just ask that you cover the service. I ask that you cover the church in the name of Jesus. 
the entire church. Father God, um, I just ask that you cover the service here, the worship, that it be done in spirit and in truth, Lord. And Father, I ask that this just be a portion of the time that we spend with you, Lord. We have an opportunity to talk to you ongoing about everything, Lord. And you are not a respecter of persons. Your word says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I just thank you for that. So I ask that this is just a touch of our day to day, that you would bring opportunities to us that we can tell others of your love, your grace, salvation, and your mercy, Lord. And for anyone who feels like they need wisdom, you have it all, Lord. So we ask you for wisdom in every decision that we make. Thank you, Lord. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Lord. There is no human word that can thank you enough, but I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.